There's something quite wonderful about coming out on the stage after one's student. <laughs> There's a lovely circularity about that, a lovely life force. Everything seems to be right in the world when a student, like Evan Solomon, comes out here and talks. I didn't know what he was going to talk about, by the way, and talks about that moment in, in time, with, which I remember quite vividly. Now, I just want to check here. How many people went to school? Put your hands up. Come on, it's not a trick question. Okay, so we have a lot of experts in the, in, the, in, the, in the audience here, which is actually quite terrific. What I'd like you to do now is take out a pen. Everybody grab a pen. It's a, it's a teacher moment. You happen to have one. If you don't have one, talk to the person beside you. If you're right-handed, use this hand. <laughs> what I want you to do is write down the name of your favorite teacher. If you, don't have a, if you don't have a pen, visualize it, his or her face in your mind. Everybody got one? Good, time's up. The next thing you're going to do is this. What qualities did that teacher have? Articulate them. What qualities did that teacher have that made him or her special to you? I want you to remember those as we, as we go through this little chat together. Now, as, as Chris said so generously, I've been in teaching now for about three decades, over de three decades. I can hardly believe I'm actually saying that. I think I've just realized something, I'm a bit of a slow learner. I think curriculum is something that we do as teachers. We follow that in school scrupulously, while students are learning something much, much more important. And I think it's important for us to refocus our collective intention on what is very important, what's really important in education. And I'll give you a hint. It's not international test scores. Education, as you know, is an, an a very, very controversial topic. After sex politics, who's going to win the World Cup? It may be Justin Bieber. <laughs> it may be one of the most controversial things to talk about in a group of people. Everybody's got an opinion. After all, we've all gone to school, as we know, and we've probably got, if you're fortunate, have, we have some students in, in, in schools around the world. So imagine if education was a person for a second. That person will have gone through so many MRIs, so many X-rays, so many ultrasounds. It's been investigated from stem to stern by so many people. And I would suggest that education is still a little ill and the doctors are still arguing. So let me wade in to the morass. Let me tell you a story about one of my teachers. Grade seven, imagine a grade seven boy. Her name is Miss Fraunis. Imagine I didn't dare make fun of her name, although God, I was tempted. <laughs> we were so frightened of her, she was absolutely a glorious, glorious force of nature. A thin switch of a woman that could cut you to the quick with a rapier-like wit before you could say, I'm sorry. She was a magnificent, magnificent teacher. We had a collective fear of her wrath, and we loved her. She had high standards of behavior. She knew what was right and what was wrong, and she cared about her students. You sensed that. Somewhere deep inside my soul, I knew she cared about me. At least, she didn't show it outwardly, and I don't think she probably feel, felt that same way about me. But that doesn't make a difference. The social psychologist would suggest that as long as you believe that person cares in you, you will adjust your behavior accordingly. So that's what I felt, and I governed my actions accordingly. We were hardwired into her, all these grade seven adolescent people. And the connection started the very first moment we came into her class. There was electricity and certainty about, about her and what she was doing that I was comfortably uncomfortable with. Remember, I'm going to this class, I'm an adolescent boy. I don't know which way is up and down. And when I left that certainty of her class, I'd go out into the playground and I was, I was thrown into the operatic chaos of adolescence, where the only certain thing that I can remember was of the girls and they were their general disdain because they seemed all older and so much wiser than I was. Gentlemen, do you remember that? <laughs> Mr. White, who has just spoken before me, also had a transformative teacher. And his name is Mr. Johnson. 
And when Chris talks about Mr. Johnson, it's in reverential tones, hushed, as if he's talking about a saint, Saint Mr. Johnson. And, and Mr. Johnson taught Chris calculus. And to this day, and I'm not kidding, Chris takes out his book, his calculus textbook, and does calculus, a couple of calculus problems, sometimes even on a Friday night. He's got to get up more often than that, I appreciate that. But that's the way he kind of reveres Mr. Johnson. But it goes to show you the impact of a single teacher on a young man. Most everyone, and I'm sure everyone here, has a teacher that he or she respects and reveres and remembers fondly. We start our schooling desperately wanting to please our teachers. And we strive to be the best in their eyes. We are so prepared in those early years to be inspired. Because our, here, our heroes, our earliest heroes are our teachers, outside of our own family. And we need, and those teachers have an opportunity to, to fulfill that need. Our chief want, as people and as students, is to be considered capable of greatness and worthy of the attention of the people who we love and respect. And the subjects those magnificent teachers taught us, they're secondary to the people that they were. They saw something in us that no one else saw, and we dared believe in them. They had faith in us. They charged us with, they could have been, they could have been charged with teaching us anything. They could have been charged with teaching us Burmese, and we would have been all fluent. That's the, po the power of some inspirational teachers. But look, as a philosopher said, so what? We've all had teachers who've inspired us. That's maybe not the issue here. For most of us, the subject they taught us was irrelevant. Or in the case of Mr. White, the subject takes on this totemic, mystical quality. It's transcendental to a certain extent. Mr. He, see, Chris channels Mr. Johnson every time he opens that, that, that textbook. Our mystic mentors don't just teach us the mandated curriculum. They teach us the, the qualities of the ideal society. Education, when it's really cooking, when it's really bubbling along, simultaneously gives us the students a glimpse of the world as it is and the world as it might be. The, you see, the best teachers create the perfect social environment. The values are clear. There's high expectations, clarity, consistency, integrity, a fervent belief in the individual, and that's balanced against the collective of the class. They teach us to expect more of ourselves. These people are strong, clear, honest, decent, compassionate, and appropriately inflexible with all of those virtues. They are the people who you trust, who put their full trust in you to do your best. That's an incredible burden and a very appropriate burden to put on a student. Great teachers make us feel that we have enormous capacity and potential and we have not reached it yet. They leave us hungry. Those teachers, if they're lucky, are in an apartment of similar like-minded people and they believe the same things that that teacher believes. If they're lucky, those apartments are embedded in a school that all believes those same things, and the administrators talk the same talk as the teachers talk to the students. We want to look for, in every great school, a comprehensive alignment amongst the parts. Yes, I'm idealist, idealistic, I'm guilty as charged, but I don't think I'm wrong. I sense I sense that, that this is under, uh, underfunded, under-resourced area of study and education. What is the culture of every school? I think we should focus on aligning structure, mission, and values within each individual school first, instead of being worried about trying uniformity, a curricular uniformity across the entire organization. The direction is wrong. Look for excellence within an individual school. Don't worry about universe, uniformity across. Each school has a culture that should be honored, promoted, fostered, challenged, led, managed, owned by everybody in the school. See, great schools are tribes, actually, with recognized rituals, 
and practices and myths that sustain them. What's, <laughs> what's really important at school is not the explicit curriculum, it's the implicit one. It's the cultures and values lived and modeled by the very best teachers and embraced by the students and the administrators and the parents. And we need to focus our attention on this over, uh, often overlooked factor. But we should step back and say, what are we really counting now in education? What's, count, what's counted? What's important? Well, if you, to believe popular press, the holy grail of education is to be found in Finland or Shanghai. See, in North America, we're enamored of big data and e educational measurement. And countries and cities are deified by the number of successful test takers. We're counting intellectual outcomes and then making ranked lists. I would say we need to look at social outcomes. That's, I think we need to be counting the right thing. I don't think we're counting the right thing right now. The praise of all things academic may have gotten a little out of hand because it's much, much easier to measure academic wherewithal than it is to measure the effect of culture on a student. I think we may be worshiping a false god, or maybe uh, it should be, it's a lesser god because academic prowess does, be, does belong in the temple of education. We should be ways of finding ways, we should be looking for ways of finding a matrix in which a student can feel valued in his or her school. Students don't come to school to learn stuff. <laughs> That's important, but it's not a motivator. They come to belong, and they return to school each day to discover how the world works and how people work. And they then develop the necessary skills to be successful. It's not information. They develop skills. They learn listening. They learn considering, distilling ideas, and, and expressing them. That it trumps facts every single time. So perhaps the most direct outcome of teachers, excuse me, students attending schools is that they learn how to be more connected to human beings and to learn the unstated and unwritten rules of social interaction. So, in summary, I think we need to redirect our energies in education. I'm not saying curriculum is unimportant, far from it. I'm suggesting it's not as important as we've made it out to be. Academic prowess is a subset of education, not the whole of it. Curriculum is just a condiment. School culture and the relationships are the seasoning and the sustenance and the main course. Oh, by the way, international test scores, that's fast food. Easy to get, easy to read, fills you up, really doesn't sustain you. I'm, really, I'm trying really hard now not to think about pizza as kind of a fast food, but I don't go there. So, so look, great schools, great school cultures anticipate our desired futures. How schools work or don't work can be quite predictive, for better or for worse. Students learn how the world could work or should work by living and breathing and learning in every school. And I can't think of a more important vocation as a teacher. Schools are tiny societies social, integrated networks. And I'll bet the greatest schools around the world, whether they be in Finland, Shanghai, Scotland, or Scarborough, are schools in which there is a clarity of values. There's an alignment of practices. And I don't believe that high test scores, making a student feel that he belongs or she belongs in, in, and is valued in that school are antithetical. In fact, I think they're very, very closely aligned. And I would suggest that great schools do both. We should never forget that it's at its very, very heart, education is a collaborative exercise. It's the passing of social norms and aspirations, not just information. The pur purpose of education is to promote and disseminate the very best of human enterprise, action, and intent. Our students learn equally about how the world works and how it could work with each class that they take and each inspiring teacher they emulate and they love and who love them back. Woodsworth wrote, the child is father of the man. The magnificent and wonderfully complicated world of school is the parent of future society. 
when we get our schools right. And I think we will when we focus our attention on what's really important, which is individual school culture and the values laid in relationships within it. And they, 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 they form it and they sustain it. When we get that right, all will be right in tomorrow's world. Thank you.